Hello and welcome to Into Your Life podcast. I'm Lenka and I'm joined here by my wonderful co-host Natalie. Hi, we invite you to join our weekly conversations about finding more life in one's life. Well, what does it actually mean? We have discussions with guests about ways to live happier, healthier and more fulfilling lives, both personally and professionally. That sounds great. Let's go. Today we have another wonderful guest and we are going back to a topic that we explored a couple of times. A couple of times, myself and Natalie, and we did have another guest on this topic. And I think it's so important. There's so much still to uncover, to have a different perspective and get more advice. So today's guest is a lovely Kim who is a financial well-being speaker, trainer, and consultant. And she is a specialist trauma of money coach and mentor. So you can guess that the topic today is going to be money. Welcome, Kim. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you very much for inviting me. So could you introduce yourself a little bit more and explain to people what it is that you actually do as a um, money coach as you know trauma of money coach and mentor what does it mean what do you help people maybe how you get there just introduce yourself to the people that are listening okay so I have been working with people and their money for over 35 years so I went straight from college into finance and spent a very long time as a stockbroker a wealth manager a private banker dealing with people and their money, growth of money, inheritance of money, um, leaving money to the next generation, and, and, and basically helping people make more of their money, which was great. But I also saw the other side of our relationship with money, the fear, the responsibility, the questions that we want to ask, but we're a little bit afraid that if we ask them, we might look silly or we might look um, ignorant. And so many people, whether we have lots of money or little money, have these fears and these expectations and lots of behavioral patterns around their relationship with money. Some of them are good, some of them are not so good. And that's something that we don't talk about enough. We look at somebody and we think that because they've got money or they've got a big house or they drive a nice car, that it must be okay for them, that it's easy. But everybody has different issues with money, different money stories, different backgrounds. And different levels of, of responsibility. And so over the years, I became more and more fascinated with the, the patterns of behavior, the things that people don't talk about, the toxic relationships that some of us have with our money, those habits that we want to break and can't seem to break if we're spending too much or we're giving it all away too quickly. And over the years, Although it was great to be able to talk to my clients about those things, I could only ever talk to a few people. So you know, money affects everybody. We all have it coming in. We all have it going out every day. We worry about it. We want more. We, we don't know what to do with it. We don't know how to talk about it. And that affects everybody. And so a couple of years ago, um, I took the bold decision to leave my very lovely corporate career behind and to develop my other passion which was for coaching mentoring and teaching which I've been doing since about 2005 to say let's just focus on this and help more people not just the people who are lucky enough to employ a wealth manager or a private banker but help more people talk about understand and get confident with their their money and so I handed back my corporate cards and set up my own business and now I spend all my time helping other people um, with their with their money whether that's management of it 
being able to have conversations with their partner or their children about it, whether that is understanding their paperwork, if they get their pension statement through and they just don't understand some of the terminology, but they don't want to ask their accountant because they don't want to look silly. And I help people get that next level of confidence. But along with that, there's a whole deeper side of it. And we often hear about money mindset, our habits and our behaviours that we've heard from our parents and you know, the sayings that we had as we were growing up that we still hold on to. Things like you know, money doesn't grow on trees or you have to work hard for money or it's money burns a hole in your pocket. There's a lot of sayings that we've adopted over the years that we still live by. But there's also some deeper issues going on. And they are traumas, the effects of trauma that are not just things we think, but they're things we feel. And the things we feel drives our behaviour. So if we are afraid of money, or if we are carrying an element of shame, that's something that we feel in our body. If we're feeling anxious, then just saying affirmations is not going to help us feel better. We need to work out what is it that's making us anxious. Where in our story, where in our past does that come from? And only when we've got that can we then start to work with it and change our approach to money and have that freedom and that healthier relationship with it going forwards. So I can never do this in one sentence. It's always a very long paragraph, but that's essentially my my background and you know why I've chosen to do this because it's just so important that we we talk about it more with more people absolutely I think this is such an important topic to talk about for a lot of the reasons that you mentioned obviously money is such an integral part of our lives we cannot survive without it even though often I would like to move to the woods and be the feral woman of living in a cottage surrounded by <laughs> deer. that's not realistic for most of us and money is one of those things that it can cause a lot of pain and lots of anxiety, a lot of relationship issues, lots of personal issues, lots of traumas. And yet it's still one of those topics that we don't talk about. We see as money conversations, as conversations only rich people have or the wealthy people have or only the top level of you know managers and financial advisors have. And I was talking with some people the other day, I realized that there is a real shame and fear and anxiety around reaching out to a financial advisor to admitting that, you know, we might not have as much savings as we should, that we don't know what we're doing with our money, actually. And yet we have accepted to go to a PT if we need help with our training. We have accepted going to a nutritionist if we don't understand how to eat well. If accepted to even going to therapy when we need someone to really help us navigate our emotions and our traumas. But when it comes to money, when it comes to the practicalities of money, of knowing how the financial banking system works, what kind of a financial products we might need when it comes to the healing of the money traumas, we still are afraid and we don't know where, where to even start. So if someone is listening and they're thinking, okay, this feels like me, this feels like something that I need to attack, I need to handle, I need to open up the conversation. How can people start? Because it is a vast area and there's so many things to unpack. How can people start? So first of all, if we're not talking about our money at home or with our friends, then we can start there. Because you know that's on a very basic level, just having a conversation, anything to do with money. Um, perhaps it's something along the lines of, you know, where would you like to go on holiday if money was no object? Where would you go? What would that mean to you? Would that be a cottage in the in the woods or would that be you know, a, a luxury hotel somewhere very glamorous? And and what does that mean to you? Why would that why would that be a goal? What would what would light you up inside about that holiday? And then you can talk about so how would we get that? money together what could we do together and that's quite a an easy and fun way of opening a, a conversation about money it's not talking about money stress it's not talking about bills or the cost of living it's actually playing with it a little bit and once we start 
then we can often move the conversation into something a little bit more mundane. And, and then if we talk about the fact that we don't have savings for our holiday, how do we go about getting those savings? What do we need to do? Could we look at that together? Could we go online? Have we got a, a banking app on our phone that we could call up while we're here talking about it? And before you know it, we've started saving money. So sometimes just opening that conversation in a more relaxed and fun way gets the, the, the thing started. And that's the most important thing. But of course, for many people, they're worried about their money. And so talking about a lovely holiday doesn't feel as though it's real. You know, that's something that is much further down the line. And if we feel that we can't talk about our money worries with our partner or our friends, then we need to, to take a bigger step. And that can be very daunting, even for people who have got a good relationship with money or who have a good level of education or a previous good history with money. It can still be very daunting. And even financial advisors and wealth managers and bankers have money worries as well. And they've got to have the conversation as well. So you know, it affects everybody. And the thing to do there is to simply take a deep breath and have that conversation. Because with all of these things, they generally build up and build up and build up. And we make them into this big beast and we are afraid of the beast. But when we have the conversation and we start it off on the phone or in, in the bank or online on, on Zoom or something, the response is generally very positive. And we feel this instant sense of relief that we've started that conversation. And it's not as bad as we think it's going to be because the bank and the accountant and the, the tax lawyer and the financial advisor, they are there to support you. And when we have real money worries and we're in a huge amount of debt, for example, or we're worried about getting ourselves out of a, a situation, there are also people who are specially trained to support you with that as well. So it's hard to start the conversation, but once you've started it, it's like going for exercise. The, the hardest thing to do is to put your, your kit on and, and get out of the front door. Once you've done that bit, it's easier. Um, so we just need to start and and don't feel stupid. You know, 70% of people have money worries of some sort at the moment. So that means that all of the financial people are expecting it. They know that over half the people who walk through the door or who pick the phone up are suffering from this. So you're not on your own. You might feel like you are but you're very definitely not. So if we can just start the conversation at home, great. Let's just get talking about money and talk about anything to do with money. But if we need to go that step further, there's no substitution for just you know, putting our big girl's pants on and, and, and doing it, but knowing that actually it is going to be one of the best conversations you can, can have. And I think part of the process also has to be working with oneself is to know that to have this type of conversation with family, with partner, with friends. Yes, I can have a conversation and complain and matter, but to approach it in a healthy, productive, meaningful way, I also need to get probably more aware of what might be my own limiting beliefs, what might be my own money mindset is holding me back what might be my fears that is it the fear of judgment is it the fear of failure what is it and is there something how would you help people how would you guide people to look inwards because we touched on the fact that the things that we have inside of us the stories that we have that they will be often deeply rooted from childhood from generation from systemic inequality potentially and we there's something we can do externally we just talk to people but i'm sure there's something that we can do internally to help ourselves as well so externally on a on a practical basis that the hardest thing for most people is to actually face the facts they, they often guess what their situation is so on a practical basis 
getting the numbers. There's no point in being worried about money if you don't know what your bills are. You may be worrying about nothing. So sometimes simply looking at the real situation and saying, oh, actually, it's not as bad as I thought it was. You know, that can help on it on its own. But for some people, that's the solution is simply looking and saying, OK, now that I've looked once, I can look again tomorrow or I can look again next week. But if we if we do that and we still feel that anxiety or that that fear or we don't know how to respond to that, then we need to get curious and we need to explore. So first of all, ask yourself the simple question, how do I feel about this? Uh, do I do I feel fearful? Do I feel anxious? Do I feel really worried? Am I upset about what I see? Am I angry about the fact that I've spent all this money and not, got nothing to show for it? How do I really feel? And from there, we can explore it a little bit more. So if you feel angry that you've spent money, why did you spend that money? You know, was it because you were trying to escape something? Was it because you were trying to fix something else in your life, trying to make yourself feel better because you're in an unhappy relationship or an unhappy job? Asking the questions of ourselves gives us some clues. So if we're working together with clients as, as coach and client, they are the type of questions that we start with. You know, how does it make you feel? And and then where does that that come from? You know, why are you feeling angry? Why are you feeling frustrated? Is it because you're going round and round in circles and you keep trying to do the budgeting and you keep trying to spend less, but it never seems to work? OK, what's going on there? So unraveling all of these things can take a little bit of time, but it's being curious and being honest with ourselves. Because so many people say, you know, well, how do you feel? Well, I feel fine. Or what do you want? Well, you know, it's, I, I just want more money. And, and they shut the conversation down. So we need to pull it out a little bit more. And so, yes, getting curious and, and exploring the next step. One of the, the things that I've, I do myself and something that I'm also noticing with my husband is the I it varies on on what I'm earning at the time but every week I put money aside so it could be like 10 pounds or 20 pounds or 30 pounds so every week it goes into an envelope and it's there and it's either there um for something that needs to be paid or for a something nice or whatever but it, it's almost becomes a habit that it's it's a form of saving mm -hmm. and because it's sort of like squirreled away in a drawer it's it's there and you know it's there and it gives you that safety and it's not always necessarily accessible like having it in your wallet when you're out at the shops so that's something that I've done for years and and um, I love doing it and it usually goes on a holiday or a weekend away or something because it's it just gets you into that practice of, of of saving. And it's it's quite interesting when you talking about sort of discussing money and that is my husband and I are looking to immigrate or me to go back to South Africa, him immigrating to South Africa. And it does require a lot of conversations because we've got to work together at this. You know, what money do we need for him to get his you know, residential permit, what does he need to be having coming in monthly, what what do we need to move, what do we need, you know, the, the real logistics, What and it even down to what books we're keeping, what's shipping over. But it's still part of that conversation because my husband's quite what's in the bank, it goes into bills, and he does struggle with looking ahead. And I say, well, if we put aside... 10 pounds a month 20 pounds a week or, or whatever it is that will accumulate but it's 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 that struggle to see the bigger picture it's the money's there I need to pay this and this and why would I put it aside and 
it's 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 almost like there's there's something missing with putting money aside for a future date for something that's intangible at the moment because it's an idea that we want to move to South Africa it's not a concrete thing so it's like yes but I could need the money for this instead and and this is something that I'm coming up with is this almost this missing piece of the puzzle this I know I'm, I'm we're doing this we've got this goal in mind I know I need money for it, but I don't quite know how to put that money in place. Is that something that you find on, on you know, when you're working with people, they, there's almost this, this missing, I don't know, puzzle piece or something. Does that sort of make sense? Remember at the beginning I said about opening the conversation by saying, where would we go on holiday? Because that's exactly, if we can get used to doing that sort of thing, that's not tangible right now. That's saying at some point in the future, I want to climb Machu Picchu. Or at some point in the future, in five years time, I want to go to Niagara Falls. And so when we start to do that as, as part of our everyday conversation, then having that more realistic goal, we want to go to South Africa. Okay, what does that look like for us? Why do we want to go to South Africa? You know, what would that mean to us? Now, because you are from South Africa and your husband isn't, it will mean different things to each of you. So you have to open that conversation, first of all, about what going to South Africa looks like and feels like and means to each of you. And to have those discussions before the money side of things, because it may be that for you, it's really obvious that that's what you need to do. And so saving for it is easy because you've got that tangible you've you've seen it you've lived it you know it but for him it might be a little bit unknown a bit scary he's got to leave things and people behind to go somewhere new and and so there's that conversation around the actual you know event why we're doing it why we want to work towards it and then when you're comfortable with that you can say okay so how are we going to get there what do we need to do to get there? We have to prove that we have this much money behind us or we need to, to fund these airfares or it's going to cost us this much money to put our stuff in storage. So you can then start working out the tangible elements of it. So those figures will change because the airfare today will not be the same as the airfare when you go, but you've got a good idea. And so you can start to create these little visionary elements of it that form part of that bigger picture knowing that the bigger picture is now comfortable for both of you so it's that conversation that needs to just continue in order to say you know what what are we going to do with this money this month are we going to spend it on something today or are we going to put it into the airfare fund or are we going to put it into the the storage fund or the capital adequacy fund to prove our our net worth knowing what you want at the end of it will help you then make those decisions on a day-to-day -day basis you can also have two pots of money so you have your envelopes and you can have one envelope that is for South Africa and one envelope that is for anything else that might crop up so that you don't feel that everything is going towards South Africa, that you still have choices today and you can still go and have a bit of cake or coffee or a nice lunch because you've already put some money into the South Africa fund. So sometimes we feel as if our focus is only on one thing. It doesn't give us any permission, any leeway to do anything else. And that can be great if it's your passion. I really want to go home to South Africa. It's home for me. And it might be very terrifying for somebody else, but they don't want to say that because they don't want to, to upset you. But if you can then say, but that's OK, because you can still do this now. We can still have this today. We can still go on a long weekend in the UK and just enjoy a bit of time. We will still get to South Africa because we have another pot for that. 
So being very respectful that different people have different reasons to want something. And this is where we go back to the money stories is that we have, we all have these different bases from which we start. Different cultures, different countries in this case, different generations, you know, different classes. A hundred years ago, we would have stayed very much within the community, the class that we were born into. Because now we can go anywhere. And that means that we've got to open up the conversation in order to be able to respect and understand somebody else's set of money stories so that we can help them work on the things that they need, the things that they're afraid of, so that we can all have the best experience with our money going forwards. This is such an interesting conversation and it really nicely touches on one of the books I've been reading, which is about sales, but there was this fascinating study that people did was around why we are not saving up for pension more. And actually in these studies, they found that we really see ourselves now and ourselves in the future as two different people. We don't connect those two images. And only if and when in the research they showed people either virtual reality or photos generated of them and it had to be them, it couldn't be just a random old person to be linked to them, picture, visualization of how they will look when they're 70, 80 and they got them looking at them and thinking about them. Only then it started to connect it. Oh, this is me, this is my future. And if I want, when I'm there, to a certain lifestyle, to a certain comforts and safety, then I need to do changes now. And then they imagined, uh, allow people to imagine spending a thousand dollars in different pots. And only after the exercise of people looking at themselves at a certain age, people saw increase in the desire of people to save. Otherwise, people were always looking more at me now and what I need in the immediate future rather than me, them, me in the future. So I think this is such a wonderful, helpful exercise that you mentioned, Kim. Really kind of imagine who am I going to be? Where am I going to be? How am I going to be in, you know, it could be in five, 10 years, it could be in more, but really connect me now with the me in the future to build this mental link to integrate both in the present time. It can be quite difficult because, of course, it's not very long ago that we would get to a certain age and then we would give up on life. So when you retired, you were expected to just be old. You weren't expected to go and travel or take up a new hobby or take up a new sport. And in more recent years, the last 20 years or so, it's become much more expected that when you retire, You've still got your health, you've still got your mobility and your fitness, you've still got mental capacity most of the time. So they are your best years, potentially. You haven't got to worry about children. You haven't got to worry about only having four weeks holiday a year from work. You've got all the time to do all of the things that you want to do in, a, in this sort of next 10 years of our lives. We've got this amazing opportunity to go and have fun and to travel and to take that longer trip to Australia and New Zealand instead of trying to pack in a two week holiday. And you know, if we've always wanted to take up golf or learn to scuba dive or go skiing, that's the, if we haven't done it so far, that's the opportunity to do it. And we can see other people doing that now. We need to, to recognize that and say, when I retire, that's what I want to do. I want to be like that person there and not like that old person over there. And therefore I need to, to fund that. And if I want to have fun in retirement, if I want to have fun and have choices, I've got to put some money away. And it's easy for people to say, but I might not live that long. And the truth is, yes, you might not live that long, but hopefully and probably you are. And if you are, you want to enjoy it. So we've got a life to live today. We've got a life to enjoy today and to navigate through the challenges of you know, cost of living crises and having children and losing jobs and all of those things that happen. 
but we've also got a future. And that future is one that we really want to enjoy. We don't want to be miserable old people. We want to get out there and have fun. So it's like, talk about talk about fun. Don't necessarily talk about care fees or, you know, being old. Talk about making the very best of your best years, which are ahead of you. And I think that that's what it what it is about. It's it's wanting to create something, whether it's in our case potentially moving back to South Africa, or whether it's going scuba diving once you retire, or what it is. It it's planning for the life that you want, as opposed to just thinking about surviving the rest mm. of your life. And it's it's about putting things in place or putting finding a way that works for you and as as I mentioned earlier envelopes work work nicely for me it's just putting it in and then you can have different bank accounts for them but you know some people use these apps that when they buy something I think a couple of pennies goes into yep. a separate account so it's it's finding something that works but I think also is like you mentioned it's the communicating but it's finding the right way to communicate so as you mentioned earlier it's it's about helping my husband to understand about the money to move the funny thing is it was actually his idea to move to South Africa not mine he loves it there but the the money concept is is almost too big for him but again he is from that generation where is what you had is went on bills and everything else they didn't necessarily he wasn't brought up with the idea of saving and investing or putting money aside for things you just had money and put it maybe for a car or something but not for this fun stuff as you mentioned and I think it it is about as you said starting from the beginning is communicating is having the conversations and then taking taking them out there I mean at the moment there's so many people like yourself who will help to help guide what do we do how can we do it do we need to have a load of envelopes in the house or do we have a lot of little bank account what works for us how can we do this as individuals but maybe also as as a couple or even as a family and this is something is as kids, you're not taught to save. You're not taught about money. Is yes, you get pocket money, you go spend it on sweeties. Well, I did anyway. And and not taught about, you know, can we invest the money or do we put money aside for that nice outfit that we want? Or what happens when we get late teens or early twenties and we're starting to work? What do we do then? And how do we invest? It's almost like you hit your mid twenties and then you get an educated about money and it's like, but it's a little bit late then. So it's bringing that back to the family is helping your kids to learn about money and having that mindset and working on it yourself so that you not passing on the limiting beliefs that you were brought up with. I mean, for me, it was money doesn't grow on trees and, rich people are bad <laughs> if you got money you're a bad person type of thing and not passing on these beliefs to your kids but helping your kids to find a way to to save money and doesn't mean just saving it so that you never use it or it's there for when you're 60 I mean at a 13 year old you can't even imagine being 60 and retiring but just learning to save for that cd that you want or that outfit that you want or to go on a, a day trip with your friends or something it's just fine learning how wonderful money can be because money isn't an evil thing it's it's something that can create a lot of opportunities and a lot of different things so it's almost like you've got to go back to the the family to the kids, helping the kids educate the, the children to have a good relationship with money, whether it, you've got it or you haven't got it, learning about it and not having this fear of money and this um, getting it wrong or that it's it's this, this, this thing that is bad 
but that money is just a form of currency. It's it's paper and copper and bits and pieces. I don't know exactly what's in it, but it's a form of currency. It's a it's an opportunity. It's choices. It's it's a lot of different things, and not all of it is bad. So it's it's I'm loving this conversation because you you almost simplifying things or or making ideas coherent so thank you for that it's it's You're welcome but that's what we need to do we need to just talk about it in in very simple over the dinner table ways so so money is a, an, an an enabler the more we have the more that we can do the more that we can support other people the more that we can give to our favorite charities the more that we can employ people if we have a business so it's not a bad thing it's an enabler. We can do more if we have more money. But that doesn't mean that it makes us a, a bad person. You know, there can there are some very bad rich people, but there are some very bad poor people. And there are some very good rich people and some very good poor people. So having those conversations with our children, you know, when we were young, there were role models on the television or characters on the television or in films that were very stereotypical. You know, the the rich person was always very portly and very, you know, looked very greedy and often had that air of arrogance about them. And then the poor, hardworking person was very disheveled and, you know, quite wiry and, and, and sort of very humble. And there was it was sort of portrayed that that was how it was supposed to be. And if you see something like that on the television, when you, you know, you've got your children there, talk about it. You know, just have that conversation and say, well, what do you think? What you know, does does that person who live in lives in that big house over there? What do you think of them? Or the person who um, is driving the old car? You know, what do you think that that means? And then question them again. Get curious. Just because you drive an old car doesn't mean that you're poor. Just because you drive a brand new top of the range car doesn't mean that you're rich because you may have funded that on credit. So. Talking about money in all of these different ways can just help. But in terms of saving for the future, talking about choices is the best thing to do. Now, if you you have your pocket money or your birthday money or your Christmas money or whatever it is that you have, what do you want to spend it on? If you spend it on this, you can't have this other thing. So perhaps you're going on holiday later in the year and you want to encourage them to save some of their money so that they can buy stuff on holiday, whether that's ice cream or souvenirs or day trips or whatever. So you can say, you know, you have £10. Why not spend £5 now? If you want to spend some now, half it, you know, and then put the other half in your envelope or in your bank account for your holiday. But you can't do both. Because if you spend it all today on sweets, then when we go on holiday, you're going to have nothing. And as a parent, you've then got to be very strong because if they spent it all today and they have nothing left for their holiday, you've got to be careful that when you go on holiday, you don't just say, oh, here you go. Here's some more money because they will then come to expect that. So it's it's really talking about it, but then sticking to it. And that's something that is hard for parents to do because we want an easy life and you know, we, we want to keep helping. But actually, we're going to help them more if we say, you know, you can't do everything. Make it make a choice. And if you don't want the sweets today, then you can put all the money in your holiday fund or you can put some of it for your um you know, to buy Christmas presents for your friends or you know, have the conversation. What do you want to do with your money? It doesn't have to be saving for a pension when they're only 13, but perhaps having spending money for the school holidays is a is a good one. Or if they want a, a, a new bike or a new games console, you know, save for that. Don't give them the money up front and ask them to repay you because that's encouraging a debt culture. But instead, have that pot of money with a picture of the games console or a picture of the new bike and, you know, save towards it. And if you want to spend some on sweets today, that's fine. But also save towards the thing that you want later on. 
that's a really good life lesson, not just for money. It's, you know, consequences and responsibility, like you said, as a parent to be strong and not cave in when you're on holiday and saying, oh, yeah, have some money. But allowing them to learn about that, that you spend your money on sweets in March, so therefore in July you don't have money to get that ice cream on holiday. And it, and it is – have these. These are life lessons that that will help in so many different ways, and also as you said, it's maybe buying that new, that better bike that you want or that game console that you want is they will also then learn to value what they have much more. So it's not just about educating them on money, but giving them these life lessons that will help them through the rest of their life and realizing that you know, actions have reactions and there's consequences, you know, whether good or bad, but there's consequences to choices that you make and whether you want to live with that consequence or not and and what can you do. So it's a really good, almost like a learning tool that is a good way to teach it because it's 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 in their control to to whether they're going to save the money or not. And I think that's that's a, a great thing. And as you said, as I mean, I'm not a I'm not a parent, so it's easy for me to say, yeah, but it's easy, just <laughs> say no. But I do appreciate that it can be it can be difficult, especially when they put on the big brown puppy dog eyes and, and everything else. If they throw a tantrum, you know, that's that's the other thing. If you're if if you're taking your children to the supermarket, for example, and they're putting things in your trolley and you haven't got the energy to say no, then the children will soon realise that all they need to do is to, to cause a tantrum or cause a fuss and you will give in. So it might just be a comic or a few sweets or you know a particular cereal for breakfast, but that's going to lead on to other things. You're already starting to create a pattern of behaviour for that child and their expectation starts very young. So it's our response as adults, whether we're parents, whether we are you know, neighbors, whether we are godparents or aunts or uncles, whatever, we all have that, that ability to influence people. And so we need to take that responsibility really quite quite seriously because the the learned behavior that, that children have is is really strong. You know, they pick up things from us all the time. They pick up our language. So if we're saying you can't have, we can't afford, we're we're broke, we're skint, you know, it's all right for you. you no, know, I can't do this. We can't go there. Then that's what they're going to pick up. And they're going to have this feeling themselves of lack and that they were hard done by or they were hard up as children. Whereas, in fact, they probably weren't. You know, I, I grew up in the 1970s when I heard my mum many times saying, you know, we can't have this or we can't afford to do that. And it took me a long time to realise that actually pretty much everybody in the 1970s felt the same way because it was just a tough time in the economy. So it wasn't that my family were poor. Everybody was finding it tough, but I felt because I heard all the time, no, 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 no. I thought it was just us. It wasn't until I was much older that I realized that it wasn't just us. So we have to talk about these things in a way that is positive, but realistic. And you know, all of these behaviors, the, 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 the talking, the, you know, do we talk about money or do we argue about it? If we talk about it, you know, it might be a hard conversation, but it's a different different thing to having a big argument about it because the argument stays with us. We feel that in our body. That can then lead to, you know, ongoing, we can't let go effects. So you know, the way that we handle all of these things is really, really important. And we focused a lot of today's sessions and talking mainly about kind of personal and family finances and money and how it impacts us in relationships and family with kids. But one of the topics I would still like to open up, it's money in professional life, in our careers as business owners, as professional women, professional people. 
but especially women, because I know that you're very passionate about the connection between you know, money and gender inequality, especially then going and looking at women going through perimenopause and menopause and the cost of it. So could you touch on some of the topics that are related to the money mindset and trauma when it comes to careers and professional life and running businesses? And let's open up specifically the topic maybe for women. Okay, so in terms of, of people who are employed, first of all, we we very recently had some changes whereby you know we have the, the the gender pay gap closing for particular age groups, and so in the younger age groups we see very little difference in in the amount that that we're being paid, and we also have provision for employed people now to have to contribute to a pension fund. Um, so we're we're making changes that move forwards, but of course it doesn't mean that everything is equal because all of those people before who didn't have the benefit of equal pay, who didn't have to put money into a pension fund, who you know a, a woman was much more likely to avoid putting money into a pension fund because she was paying childcare instead or because she was working part-time, because she was also covering some of the childcare herself, she didn't have spare money to put into pension fund. And yet her partner, her husband, you know, may well have had that money, worked full-time, wasn't paying the childcare, so had his money growing in his pension pot. So we've had many, many years where we've had big differences. And for women of my age, uh, which is somewhere in their 50s, the gender pay gap is still 15%. So, you know, we still have a very big pay gap, although my daughter, who is 29, has a very narrow pay gap, or it's almost you know, non-existent. So it's changing, but for those of us that didn't have the benefit of these recent changes we've got big gaps to fill and and yet we want to, you know we've worked really hard we've broken those glass ceilings we've entered careers I was a stockbroker my mother or my grandmother would never have had that opportunity you know I made lots of sacrifices and worked really hard to have the career that I wanted but we still had that very big difference between what I earned and what a lot of my male colleagues earned and some of that was because I was you know a, a mother some of that was because I was a woman some of that was because I didn't have the confidence to ask for a pay increase and some of it is because actually in the corporate world for many people it's a disciplinary offense to talk about your salaries with your colleagues so we have no idea what our colleagues are, are earning. We have no idea if we're being paid fairly or not, because the culture is that you do not talk about it. So how can we find out if we're being treated fairly? We have to trust our employers and we have to trust the system. And we all know that that's not always going to be the, you know, the, the result that we want. So, so there's lots of things that are historic and, you know, for, for women, but a lot of those come from just one or two generations back. You know, when I had my, my children nearly 30 years ago, it was still expected that I would give up work and not return to my career until perhaps they were at school, that I would have a career break. So that's a big, you know, that's a big gap when many women were not expected to earn any money at all. We didn't have the ability to take long-term you know, maternity leave and then to return to our jobs. It, you had to make a decision when your baby was literally just a few weeks old, whether you were going back to work or not. So for many women who've just had a baby and their baby's only six weeks old and their hormones are still raging and they haven't had any sleep, when they're asked to make that decision, are you returning to this career or are you leaving? you just sort of go, oh, I don't know, I can't, I can't do it right now. And so you take yourself out of the workplace. Because now we have you know, longer periods where we can make those decisions. We can get the support. We can 
arrange the child care. We can build our strength and our energy back up again. And we can go back into work at a comparable level to the one that we left at. But of course, later on in life, we get hit again. So we get to our late 40s or our 50s and we start feeling the effects of perimenopause or menopause. And at the time when we should be earning our biggest amount of money, because we have smashed those glass ceilings and we've got all the qualifications and we've made all the sacrifices, then our hormones start playing with our memory a little bit. And you know we start losing confidence because we've got brain fog or we're having hot flushes. And very often at the time when we should be going for our last big promotion, we actually feel very lacking in confidence. And so we step away again. So, you know, being a woman is, it's not an excuse at all. It's a fact that we have the children. It might be that we then share the childcare, but we are the ones who have to give birth. And then we are the ones who are experiencing menopause. And, you know, we need to be able to navigate that better so that we don't step away from work. We can be supported and, and keep going so that we can keep earning, because if we don't keep earning, we, we're not contributing to our pension. We're not building our savings. We're not doing all of those things to give us that better future. And so the gaps get bigger. So you know, that's the employed side of it. But, but it's even worse when we're self-employed because we have no obligation to pay a minimum wage to ourselves. We have no obligation to pay into a pension for ourselves. So if we are employing other people, we will make sure that they are well paid. We will pay into their pension fund. And we, the business owner, are often down at the very bottom of the pile. And we're doing all of the work. We're putting all of the hours in. We're putting all of our, our love and our energy into building our business and supporting everybody else and our communities and, you know, great things. And then we look at what we have. And we don't have anything there because the the legislation isn't there to support us. And we're too busy thinking about other people. So there's lots and lots of, of areas that we need to change, whether we're employed or self-employed. I think that there is so much we could go in and unpack. And I'm glad that we managed to touch on it because I think that you know, sooner or later, we'd love to have you back in for more depth in some of these areas that we touched on. But I think that this has been a great overview for anyone and everyone out there who is thinking about their money or is feeling like strong emotions around their money and finances and they're struggling to know where to start. And obviously if they now have met you and if they really don't know and they can't help themselves, then they know where to go and have a look and connect with you. Before we wrap up, is there something like one last key lesson or a tip that you were hoping to share, a thing that you were hoping we're going to have a chance to talk about that you would like to share with our listeners? So I would just like to say it's never too early to start and it's never too late to start. So don't ever think that you've got to your 40s, your 50s or your 60s and just because you have no savings, it's too late. You know, it's always possible to start. And the other thing is that there is never too little. We, we touched very briefly on small amounts of savings every month or some of the apps where you can you know, just move pennies into your savings account. It all adds up. So the only thing that's not going to work is if you do nothing. If you do nothing and say it's too late or it's too little, then there will be no change. You will never have anything. But if you do little and often, you know, it will build up. So just do something. Today is the best day to start. Absolutely love it. Thank you so much for being here, taking the time to chat with us and share your wisdom. If someone wants to follow up and find out more about you and learn more from you, where is the best place for them to find you online? 
So you can come and find me on Instagram. I am Kim Uzel Money Coach. So my surname is U double Z E double L. So there's not many of us around. And you can find me as well on uh, LinkedIn and Facebook. You can even find me on TikTok. So uh, wherever you are online and the new one threads is out today and I'm already on there. So you know, if they're if, if you're online, you know, just look for Kim Uzel and you will be able to find me. Send me a message. Open up that conversation. And uh, you know, let's just get people talking about money. Perfect. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much, listeners, for staying with us through this. Maybe not so sexy topic, but a very important topic. And if you have any questions or there any specific topic within this arena that you would like to learn more about and hear more about, then please do let us know. Uh, find us on social media and drop us a comment. And for that, that's enough for today and we'll speak with you soon. If you enjoyed listening to our conversation, please share it with your friends and colleagues and don't forget to subscribe. We would love it if you could give us a five-star rating and write a short review.